Carnation Evaporated Milk presents Debbie Reynolds on Stars Over Hollywood. I'm going to discard all the silly romantic notions I ever had about men. I'm going to scrap the idea that one man is a single bit different from the next. I'll marry the first man I meet. Welcome to Hollywood, home and workshop of the world's most glamorous people. Each week, Stars Over Hollywood presents in person the world's best-known stars, actors you've seen in motion pictures and heard on radio, such famous names as Jan Sterling, Lee Bowman, Jane Wyman. Today, Carnation, the world's favorite brand of evaporated milk, brings you by arrangement with MGM, producer of the Technicolor picture Ivanhoe, starring Robert Taylor, Elizabeth Taylor, and Joan Fontaine, one of that studio's charming young stars, Debbie Reynolds. The transcribed story, The First Man She Met. Ladies, when you buy milk, remember that no other kind of milk has as many uses as carnation. Carnation for cooking. Carnation for coffee. Carnation for baby feeding. No other kind of milk has as many uses as carnation, because no other kind of milk has carnation's own special qualities. More than double rich, you can use carnation like cream. For just as it pours from the can, carnation has the consistency of cream. And there's plenty of good rich cream in every drop. For milk purposes, carnation, diluted with an equal amount of water, gives you milk that's richer than your state standard for bottled milk. Whatever your milk needs, cooking, coffee, baby feeding, remember, it's thriftier, it's better to use carnation the world's favorite brand of evaporated milk, the milk from contented cows. And now, act one of The First Man She Met, starring Debbie Reynolds in the role of Margaret. Curtain going up. Another cup of coffee, George? No, thanks. You know, Paul, it's been a wonderful few days. I'm certainly glad I stopped by here on my way east. <laughs> I never would have forgiven you if you'd driven through without stopping. Twenty-three years since we graduated. And it's taken all this time to get you to visit me. Uh, Twenty-three years since you graduated. Only twenty for me. I was a freshman when you were a senior, remember? <laughs> yes, I'd forgotten. <laughs> well, at any rate, it is twenty-three years since we've seen each other. You never met Elizabeth. No. No, I wish I could have. She must have been a wonderful woman. Mm -hmm. Margaret's just like her. Then Elizabeth must have been tops. Say, where is Margaret this morning? Oh, she'll be down in a minute. She fixed breakfast and then went back upstairs to finish those curtains she's making for Bert's office. Oh. I believe she thinks he's going to open a chintz store instead of a doctor's <laughs> office. <laughs> you know, she seems more interested in the opening of the office than she does in her own wedding. Oh, I guess it's just that Margaret and Bert have always known that they'd get married as soon as he'd finished his internship. Mm. But the office is a new proposition. Well, I hope he makes out all right here. It's pretty tough hanging out a shingle in a small town that's always looked to one doctor. Yeah. Oh, the kids will have a struggle all right, but they'll make out. Margaret's going to be his nurse and secretary and bookkeeper at first. She's got a good head in her shoulders. He's got more than that, Paul. He's a wonderful girl. Yeah, if I were 33 instead of 43... Well, I'm glad you're not. <laughs> I wouldn't like hearing you call me father. <laughs> George calling you father, Dad? Oh, no. He, he's bragging because he's three years younger than I am. I'm just getting even because you insist on calling me Uncle George. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting you don't like it. Well, um, you two kids will have to fight this round without me. <laughs> I've got to get to the store. I have to leave soon, too. It's only a week until we open the office, and I have an awful lot to do yet. Well, isn't Bert doing anything? It's supposed to be his office. Well, he isn't as enthusiastic as I am, and... He kind of resents the second-hand cabinets and the repainted desk and all of that. I even bought some used magazines for the waiting room. <laughs> I got them for a nickel apiece. Mm, well, I never saw a magazine in a doctor's office uh, or a barber shop, for that matter, that wasn't very much second-hand. <laughs> I'd say you made a good buy on those magazines. Well, thank you, Uncle. 
I mean, George. Oh, well, I, I can see that that slip of the tongue is going to cause another discussion, so I think I'd better leave. Oh, I'll let her get away with it this time. Uh, don't forget your lunch, Dad. I put it on the hall table. Oh, thank you, dear. Well, I'm sorry about leaving you, George, on your last day here, but <laughs> I just can't afford to stay away from the store another day. Don't give it another thought, Paul. And don't forget, it's my treat at dinner tonight. Paul. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Born and raised here, I've never eaten dinner at the Continental Hotel. Well, we'll shoot the works from pheasant to champagne. Well, I don't think they have pheasant, even in season. Well, I'll settle for a steak. One, uh, this thing. <laughs> I'll see you tonight, George. Okay. Bye, darling. Bye. Well... Can I drive you down to that famous office, Margaret? Oh, no, thanks, George. You just laze around and read the morning paper. I can catch a bus at the corner in, uh, let's see, just four and a half minutes. Four and a half minutes? I, um, uh, guess you'll have to leave right away, then. Yes, I'm afraid so. But I do have to get the office done. You know, Bert and his career are the most important things in my life. And I guess they always will be. <laughs> Hit yourself, Margaret. I hit the nail right on the head, only with my fingernail. This doggone corner sport's the most awkward thing I oh, ever tried. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. I should have offered to put it up. Oh, that's all right. Uh, Bert, do you suppose there's a doctor in the house? Well, I guess that'll be about the extent of my practice. Bandaging bruised thumbs. Well, let's take a look at it. My, are we down in the dumps this morning, aren't we, Dr. Gibbons? Yes, I guess I am. I just came from Dr. Lindley's. His waiting room was full, and I guess it always will be. I don't think a newcomer will stand a chance. Oh, of course you will, Bert. It'll take a long time to build up a practice, but people will find out you're a good doctor and they'll come. <laughs> well, you are a good doctor, aren't you? I think so, but I don't think that's the important point. By the time anyone finds out, the little money I've saved up will be gone, and I'll be working as a drug clerk or a health inspector. Well, what in the world's got into you today? Seeing Dr. Lindley's office, I guess. All the newest equipment. A brand new X-ray fluoroscope combination I'd give my eye teeth for, among other things. And an office that spells money and success. Leather chairs and a chromium and glass desk. And... But it isn't the office furniture that counts. The heck it isn't. What will people see when they come in here? A repainted desk, a couple of chairs we upholstered ourselves, a used cabinet we bought from Higgins Pharmacy, and an impressive array of dog-eared books I used in school. I think you have a bad case of being sorry for yourself, Dr. Gibbons. I'd suggest a brand new wife and a change of scenery. Niagara Falls, for instance. Niagara Falls. And we haven't really got the right to spend the money for a weekend there. Well, I never wanted a Caribbean cruise, Doctor. Niagara Falls was good enough for my mother and daddy, and... It's well, good... it isn't good enough for me. And this office isn't good enough either. Not after what I've gone through to tack that M.D. after my name. Working my way through school for six long years, classes all day, and then a dozen menial jobs after school, and then studying half the night until my eyes gave out. For what? For this? Well, what alternative have you got? What else is there to do but to open this office in as good a style as we can afford? And then later on, when we can afford better, we'll Oh, be... what's the use of kidding ourselves? We won't ever be able to afford anything better. Well, then? Dr. Lindley's offered me a partnership. Dr. Lindley? A partnership? A full partnership. My name on the door. In letters just as big as his. Half the income of his office. The use of all his facilities and as many of his patients as he can steer to me. His whole practice in a few years when he retires. But why should he be willing to... Oh, I get it. Barbara Lindley. Well, he didn't say it in so many words. No, he wouldn't. Not the suave Dr. Lindley. But he's willing to treat you like a son-in-law right from the start. I, I guess it does shape up something like that. I see. Well, I won't hold you, Bert. I won't make any demands on but you. It, it isn't as though I, I gave you a ring. No, you never gave me anything as tangible as that. Maybe you were lucky you didn't have enough to buy one. Oh, you don't have to rub it in, Margaret. I know I'm being a heel. But if you dreamed and planned for things as I had... That's right. I haven't had any dreams or plans. Oh, I'm sorry, Margaret. You needn't be. I won't create a scene. And I won't berate you. I don't think you're worth it. Barbara Lindley's welcome to you. Well, what'll you do, Margaret? Well, that shouldn't worry you. Well, it does. Then I'll tell you. I'm going to discard all the silly romantic notions I ever had. And I'm going to scrap the idea that one man is a single bit different from the next. If he'll have me, I'll marry the first man I meet when I walk out this door. <laughs> And I will, too. 
I'll marry the first man I see. If I know so little about Bert after all these years, I could know a man for a lifetime, and I would Margaret. never... Margaret! Uncle George! Can't break you of the uncle, eh? Well, I... <laughs> I'll forgive you if you'll hop in and let me take you to lunch. All right. Thank you. Ah, that's the girl. Now, where would you like to eat lunch? Why, any place, I guess. Say, you must have had a rough morning. Did one of those chintz curtains bite back? Oh, no. The curtains were very well behaved. Well, that's good. I got bored with the paper, so I thought I'd take a little drive. Well, that was a good idea. I remembered you said our young doctor's office uh, would soon enliven the corner of Maple and Third. So I thought I'd drop by and uh, see if I could take the two of you to lunch. Well, that that was very sweet of you. Uh, Bert have to go out on a case or something? He's not practicing yet. Oh, well, is he back there in the office? I guess so. Well, maybe we ought to go back and see if he wants to join us. No. Oh. Sounds like the two of you had a little spat. Well, maybe it'll do you good to be separated for a few hours. Now, where'd you say you wanted to eat lunch? At the uh, Continental Hotel? But you're taking us there for dinner tonight. I'd have taken you there every afternoon and evening if I'd met you before our young medic. But that's just my luck. I, uh... I guess I'm doomed to remain a bachelor. George? Hmm? Why didn't you ever marry? Oh, never met the right girl. From what your dad tells me, your, uh, your mother must have been the kind of a girl I would have married if I'd met her first. But I, I guess they don't make many from the same pattern your mother and you were cut from. You mean if you'd met mother before dad did, you'd have married her? <laughs> If all your dad says about her is true. Of course, uh, he may be prejudiced, you know. And if I hadn't been engaged to Bert Gibbons when you met me, you might have, well... I'd have swept you right off your feet, old as I am. I don't think 43 is old. And I hate younger men. Say, maybe this quarrel with your young man is more serious than I thought. Well, it's serious. And it's final. And he isn't my young man now or at any other time. I never want to see him again, so I'm free and I'm not engaged. And I'm the same girl I would have been if I hadn't been engaged when you came. Now, I know that sounds a little mixed up, but do you know what I mean? Uh, no. Well, well, what I mean is... George, I'm asking you to marry me. <laughs> So the curtain falls on the first act of today's radio drama, The First Man She Met, starring Debbie Reynolds, and brought to you by Carnation Evaporated Milk. Before we return to the second act, let me remind you that the peach season is here, and so is Carnation's home service director, Mary Blake, to tell you how to make the most of it. No words of mine art could be as eloquent on the subject of fresh peaches as the taste of this luscious fruit served with moist and tender shortcake. Say, that sounds real good, Mary, but uh, I wonder how many women can count on their shortcake turning out as well as you describe. Didn't I mention, Art, that for best results in shortcake, use carnation evaporated milk? I wondered about that. Carnation is an important ingredient to good shortcake, isn't it? Yes, indeed, Art. When you use carnation, you get a richer, golden-colored shortcake with a lighter texture that's more tender and moist throughout. The fact that carnation is heat-refined helps account for that wonderful texture, folks. You're perfectly right, Art. And for a delicious and inexpensive topping for your shortcake, chill double-rich carnation in a refrigerator tray until ice crystals form. Whip until foamy, add two tablespoons lemon juice, and continue whipping until very stiff. Well, Mary, there's no doubt that carnation works miracles in shortcake and in whipped toppings, just as it does in so many other foods. And the best proof of that is in trying it out for yourself. Mary Blake will be back next week to tell you about another instance where Carnation performs cooking miracles not possible with any other form of milk. We return now to the second act of The First Man She Met, starring Debbie Reynolds in the role of Margaret. Margaret was very much in love with young Dr. Bert Gibbons until she became the proverbial woman scorned. 
It was then she swore to marry the first man she met. And that first man turned out to be her father's old friend, George. Now, as the three of them return home... Well, here we are home again. That was a fine dinner, George. Wasn't it, Margaret? Mm, delicious. Is everyone as tired as I am? Well, I could do with a little sleep. And we'll have to get an early start in the morning, Margaret. And, uh, you'll be married in New York? As soon as we can get the license. And, uh, you don't have to worry about Margaret, Paul. We'll drive straight through, and, uh, if we get a good start, we ought to make New York by about, uh, 10 or 11 tomorrow night. Margaret can stay with my sister Helen till after the ceremony. Now, uh, you remember Helen, Paul? Yes. Oh, I won't worry, George. And I hope you'll pardon all the blunders I made when you told me the good news. It did come as a shock, you know. No, no I, I, I don't mean shock exactly. Well, that's but all right, Paul. It came as a surprise to me, too. I, I guess we'll all have to get used to the idea. Dad. Da <laughs> now, look here, George Kane. Just because you and Mark... <laughs> oh, no, 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 I don't mean that. I'm saying a lot of things I don't mean tonight. I'm not saying the things I do mean. Well, I guess we're all a little excited. Yes, dear, that's it. What I've really been meaning to say all evening is that I'm glad to welcome you into the family, George. I know you'll be good to Margaret. I'll try to be. I still... I still can't get over a beautiful young girl like Margaret being willing to marry... Uh, you'll her. be spoiling me, giving me compliments like that. I want to spoil you. As soon as I finish my business in New York, we'll go on a honeymoon. Anywhere in the world you think you might like. Around the world, if you want to. Oh, you make me feel as though I had all that in mind when I... Well, when I proposed. When you proposed? Margaret. Now, I'll tell you all about it someday, Dad, but not now, please. Oh, she's exaggerating, Paul. I did the proposing, but an old duffer like me did need more than the average amount of encouragement. Uh, that's what Margaret meant. Well, I won't try to pretend I know what happened today. What came between Bert and you, Margaret, or how you and George decided to get married... But I just hope that neither of you will regret it. I hope you both know what you're doing. Well, I know what I'm doing, Dad. I know exactly what I'm doing. up. Okay. Margaret, I know you had a long, hard trip yesterday, but I have to talk to you. George is my only brother, you know. Yes, I know. Oh, well, I, I brought you some breakfast. Oh, that was very nice of you, considering that you don't like me. Uh, what makes you say that? You glared at me from the moment George introduced us last night until I went to bed. Yes. Yes, I suppose I did. But put yourself in my place, Margaret. George has been a confirmed bachelor for years. He lives on the West Coast and I live here. He comes to New York often and he spends all his time with me. We've been very close. And then all of a sudden he walks in with me and announces that we're being married within a few days. Exactly. And the last time he wrote, why, he hadn't even met you. Well, I can imagine how a sister feels. Dear, I hope I'm not the jealous kind of sister, but, well... If you only weren't so young and pretty, and I... And poor. You could tell that from my clothes. And you think I'm marrying George for his money. That's what I've been afraid of ever since you came in last night. I don't want to see George hurt, Margaret. He's too fine a man. I say that even though he is my brother. You don't have to apologize. He is fine and he's wonderful. Honestly, Helen, I'm not marrying him for his money. There, are you satisfied? No, not quite. There are other reasons that make young girls marry older men, other than money and other than love. I've never heard you say you love George. You haven't given me a chance. Well, do you? Where is George now? We were supposed to go down for a license this morning. He went downtown, but he'll be back any minute. And I have to have the answer to the question before he comes back, you know. Do you love him, Margaret? Well... There are all sorts of love. I once thought I was madly in love with someone else, and I found that I wasn't. So maybe I don't even know what love is. This other man, he's younger than George. Yes, but, but what you're thinking is wrong. I'm not still in love with him. I hate him. 
Well, then I guess it won't do any harm for you to close the door firmly on this other man before you marry my brother. What do you mean? I presume this other man is Dr. Bert Gibbons. Well, how did you know that he got into New York on an early plane this morning? He's in the living room now waiting to see you. I'm sorry you wasted the money on the plane fare, Bert. I have nothing to talk to oh, you please, about. please, Margaret, listen to me just for a couple of minutes. Go ahead, but it won't do any good. I went back to Lindley's office yesterday after you walked out. I told Dr. Lindley the deal was off. I told him why. And even when he agreed to take me in as a partner with no strings attached, I told him I was opening my own office. That I had to make good on my own. For you. Well, Bert, I'm, I'm glad you decided to be on your own. You'll have a better life. But I'm not going to be part of that life. Oh, I know I hurt you. But I'll spend the rest of my life making it up. Oh, please, say you come back home with me. Bert, I can't. I went back to our office after I made my decision. I called you, but there was no answer. And then I finally reached your house, and your dad said you wouldn't talk to me. There was nothing to say. So I sat there all night, looking at the drapes you'd made, and the chairs we'd covered together. And I thought of all our plans. Remember the hospital we were going to build someday? Stop it, Bert. I couldn't marry you if I wanted to. I'm marrying someone else. That was his sister who let you in. Yes, I know all about it. Your dad told me, and he gave me the address here. Margaret, I don't blame you for anything you've done. But you couldn't have stopped loving me just like that any more than I could stop loving you. And it's not fair to yourself or to him, marrying him if you don't love him. You're right, Bert. I do love you. No matter how weak you were for a little while. And I can't marry George, loving you. But, but how can I break it to him? He's so fine and he's noble and... and... he's the first man you met when you walked out of the office. George. And you'd sworn to marry the first man you met. So, I was elected. How did you know? Well, uh, I was telling you the truth when I said I'd come down to take you to lunch, but uh, what I didn't tell you was that I came into the office. You two were so busy fighting, you didn't hear me. But I don't understand the things that followed that. Well, when I heard you make your threat, I had to hurry out so you wouldn't see me and get to my car in time to be the first man you met. But why? Margaret, your father is my oldest friend. I couldn't have you marry anyone you might have bumped into. And you never intended to marry me? Well, I thought a reconciliation was likely, and I, I guess I was right. I heard most of your conversation just now, too. I'm a terrible eavesdropper. Oh, you make me feel like a spoiled, ungrateful child. Uh, don't say that, Margaret. You're a fine, courageous woman. You made your decision just now before I came in. You said you wouldn't marry a man you didn't love, even though it meant hurting someone you're fond of, giving up a great many of this world's goods. You were willing to take the step. I'm proud of you. I, uh, I hope you're worthy of a Bert. I hope so, sir. Uh, but we're not going to get along very well if you call me sir. It's as bad as being called uncle. Oh, I'm sorry, George. That's better. You know, uh, for a minute, I'd almost decided not to give you the wedding present I planned on. Oh, George. Oh, really, George? We, we no, I won't. Accept... No, no, I don't want any nonsense. You're going to accept my present, and I hope you put it to good use. It's the latest model X-ray fluoroscope combination. Gee, I... Oh, I don't know what to say. I... Oh, George, you're the kindest man who ever lived. Oh, nonsense. I'm just an amateur Cupid who was lucky in having his little plot work out. <laughs> now, beat it, you two. And the best of luck, always. Thank you, George. Thank you. So much. Bye, George. Bye. Well, <clears throat> you can come in now, Helen. I know you've been listening. <laughs> I guess eavesdropping runs in the family. That was a wonderful thing you just did, George. You're giving those kids the fluoroscope? <laughs> Nonsense. I have more no, money than I... I didn't mean that, and you know I didn't mean it. <sighs> yeah. I guess I do, Helen. Look, uh... What do you say we take a little ocean trip, eh? I've told my office I won't be back for a while, and, uh, well, I hear the sea air's good for a broken heart. And 
And so the curtain comes down on the final act of The First Man She Met. This week's Stars Over Hollywood show is presented by Carnation Evaporated Milk and starring Debbie Reynolds. In just a moment, we'll have news about next week's show. Meantime, how about coming out here for a curtain call, Debbie Reynolds? Oh, thank you, Art. I'd love to. Debbie, from the quality of your performance today, I'd say you're far from being a newcomer to the drama. Well, four years in pictures is my history, Art, not counting some non-professional work in school. Still, you must have started in show business at a fairly tender age. Well, for show business art, I don't think there's any such thing as being too young, do you? Well, I guess you're right. You know, one might say the same for carnation evaporated milk. There are no such words as too young for carnation. Babies, no matter how tiny and delicate, get along just fine on this wonderful milk. It's so easy to digest and so vital to growth. Carnation supplies important vitamin D, plus the milk minerals calcium and phosphorus, absolutely necessary to good teeth and bone development. More than that, carnation is safe for babies. Doubly safe, actually, because it's pasteurized and then sterilized after the can is sealed. Really, it's no wonder eight out of ten mothers who use carnation say their doctor recommended it. Carnation is far and away the milk every doctor knows. And now, Debbie, with our compliments on a fine performance, goes this bouquet of red and white carnations just like those pictured on every can of Carnation Evaporated Milk. What beautiful flowers, Art. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye, Debbie Reynolds. Next Saturday, Stars Over Hollywood will present the Distinguished Academy Award winner, Miss Jane Wyman, in a dramatic play titled Yesterday's Town. And now, here's Miss Wyman. He thinks he can change my whole life, does he? He thinks he can change the life of a whole town. Well, he can't, because this is one war between the states that isn't over. Thank you, Jane Wyman. I'm sure everyone will be wanting to hear you in this dramatic play. The story on today's Stars Over Hollywood presentation was written by Bud Lesser. Supporting Miss Reynolds were Bill Johnstone, Vernon Rich, Reza Royce, and Bill Boucher. Music was composed and conducted by Rex Corey, and the program was directed and transcribed by Don Clark. <laughs> Ladies, when you shop for groceries today, be sure to have Carnation, the world's favorite brand of evaporated milk, on your shopping list. No other kind of milk has as many uses as carnation. Carnation for cooking. Carnation for coffee. Carnation for baby feeding. Good, good, good. For milk that's extra good, you should get the brand that's called carnation. Rich, rich, rich. For milk that's creamy rich, you should get the brand that's called carnation. <laughs> Now, for the Carnation Company and stars over Hollywood, this is Art Balancer suggesting that you be sure to see the George Burns and Gracie Allen television show, brought to you by Carnation Evaporated Milk. Tune in every Saturday and hear the world's greatest motion picture stars in person on Stars Over Hollywood. Next Saturday, we are proud to present Miss Jane Wyman in Yesterday's Town. Stay tuned now for Grand Central Station, which follows immediately over most of these stations. Stars Over Hollywood comes to you from our Hollywood studios and is heard in Canada over the Dominion Network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. This is the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>